Director of Social Innovation at the Qatar Foundation's Computing Research Institute, where he develops and also prototypes next generation humanitarian technologies using advanced computing. Unfortunately, Patrick is currently stuck in Qatar. Therefore, he will be hanging out with us right now live via Google Hangout. Ah. Let's say hello. There he is. Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Meyer. Hi, Patrick. Can you hear us? How about try again? Can you hear us? I think he can, but we can't. He said he's having a hard time hearing us. Oh, exactly. Okay, I'll do, I'll do the speech. You just nod if I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> Today you're giving out $1 million. Five million, okay. Okay, see, look at the magic of technology. Can you try to say something? No? There you go. Yeah, there we are. Hello, hello, hello. Yep. Yep, we're good. We oui, thank you. Um, and thanks for uh, the, the, the tech setup here. Um, and so it's, it's a real honor to be here with you virtually, and I, I really apologize. Um, really, really disappointed. We tried it until the very last minute to uh, to get me uh, over to Manila, but it, it didn't uh, it didn't work out. But the magic of technology is here, and I wanted to say a very big thank you to uh, Maria and her awesome team at Rappler for organizing this and for going out of their way to help me still participate and listen to the talks this morning. It's been really engaging and passionate, so it's a it's a real pleasure. Uh, I'm happy to get started now if uh, if that works for you. Go on ahead. Sure. I'll take that as a yes. Um, so just quickly again, my name is Patrick. I direct uh, QCRI Social Innovation Program, where we develop free and open source humanitarian technologies. Now, why humanitarian technology? Well, one of the main challenges for the humanitarian community today is the rise of big data, or what I call big crisis data. And by this, I simply mean that the, that the fact that social media is increasingly used um, to communicate during crises. We know this full well. We've seen this over the past few years. 20 million tweets during Hurricane Sandy, 2,000 tweets per second after the Japan earthquake and tsunami. And we know that Twitter is not the only game in town. There are, at last count, 38 distinct social media channels and counting, and the vast majority of these get used when disasters strike. Now, this vast volume and velocity of uh, information can be as paralyzing uh, as the absence of information uh, to support and mobilize humanitarian uh, response. So we have a challenge here that is like finding the proverbial needles in, this, in, in a haystack, right? And in this case, we're looking for uh, relevant, actionable, informative information in the growing haystack of information. And finding the needles is, is, is really challenging because we're talking about millions of social media reports posted online, this user-generated content that just surges during disasters. And we know from the past experience and research that some of these uh, needles, if you'd like, will make the difference between life and death, will, will actually make a big difference for disaster response and provide situational awareness. And we also know that we don't have all the time in the world to look for these needles, right? As the International Committee of the Red Cross noted almost 10 years ago, access to information is equally important as access to food, to water, to shelter, and so on. But of all of these commodities, information is the most perishable. Information is the, the, the commodity that will turn bad, if you'd like, that will rot most quickly, because information you get now versus in 10 minutes can make a huge difference. So as a colleague of mine uh, noted on uh, Twitter recently, if you have accurate information that is hours old, you do not have accurate information in the world of social media. That really is the reality that we're dealing with. And this rise of big crisis data then presents a major, major puzzle to humanitarian organizations. They are completely unprepared to deal 
with its volume and velocity of user-generated crisis information. They were never geared to doing that. And the same is true for disaster-affected communities. They, too, face the same challenge of having this tsunami of, of information get posted and generated during disasters. But this is where the notion of advanced computing uh, can help. And this is why I joined QCRI, is to leverage advanced computing to support humanitarian response and to solve this major challenge of big crisis data. So how exactly does advanced computing do this? And, and what is advanced computing? Well, you can think of advanced computing in two ways. It is a combination of human computing and machine computing. Uh, human computing is simply a, a, a fancy word for crowdsourcing or microtasking. And I often say that, that crowdsourcing is simply a new term for the common saying that it takes a village to do something. On the other hand, machine computing leverages things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and all that sort of advanced stuff. Now, um, this may sound like science fiction, and often does to me, but I'm going to share with you some very concrete examples of human computing and machine computing used for humanitarian uh, response. And I want to start with the Philippines, where you all are right now. And we know the story from last December with, with Typhoon Pablo, one of the worst storms in 100 years to hit the Philippines, devastating very large areas. And we, we saw the video of individuals really being um, uh, affected and these human interest stories really really hit to the, to, to, to the emotional um, issue that this is really real. This is not just slides at a conference. These are real individuals losing loved ones um, in disasters, and, and that gets really emotional. It's, it's, it's very real. And these are not just tweets. These are not just technologies. It's, it's real, real life. Amidst this tragedy, we, we see glimmers of hope. We have, we have examples that, and things that happen that do, that do give us hope. And I think one of them uh, for me was to see how proactive uh, the Filipino government was. Now, I was not in, in the Philippines at the time. I was following online. And I was incredibly impressed to see the government and other organizations in the Philippines being so proactive on social media. For example, as we saw on Twitter with the government and other groups um, suggesting uh, and recommending certain crisis, crisis hashtags even before the, the, the typhoon, uh, typhoon Pablo made landfall. I mean, I've never seen that happen before anywhere else around the world. So I think the Filipinos are some of the most enlightened, active, uh, intelligent users of social media when it comes to crisis communication. It really is a model for the rest of us around the world to follow, which is why I almost always use this example when I talk about big crisis data and disaster response. It really is amazing. Now, in the context of the response to Typhoon Pablo, I wanted to share a word about the Digital Humanitarian Network. The Digital Humanitarian Network is a group that a colleague of mine at the UN and I launched uh, just over a year ago. And the purpose of the Digital Humanitarian Network is to serve as the official interface between established formal humanitarian organizations, traditional players, and connect them and match them with today's new uh, digital humanitarian networks, volunteer-based um, technical communities that, that live online, that mobilize online, they're very agile and have great skills and can really move very quickly in collecting and processing information. They act as a search capacity for these humanitarian uh, organizations. And you can see we have a, a dozen or so members uh, of the Digital Humanitarian Network, and that number is growing. I refer to this now because 48 hours after Typhoon Pablo made landfall in the Philippines, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, UN OCHA, activated the Digital Humanitarian Network. And what did they activate us for? Well, for a number of things. They wanted us to basically collect all the tweets that had been posted during those first two days and then identify which tweets linked to images and video footage that captured 
the damage caused by Typhoon Pablo. And that's not all. Once that was done, they asked us to geotag this multimedia content shared on Twitter. That is, to find out where in the Philippines these pictures and videos had been taken. And oh, by the way, they wanted us to do this in under 12 hours, which meant they were hoping and expecting us to provide them with the result of this exercise, of this digital humanitarian response by 0500 Geneva time the next morning. So how did we pull this off? Well, we turned to microtasking uh, and crowdsourcing. As I mentioned, this is an example of, of, of human computing. And we used a free and open source platform used for citizen science projects, typically, uh, called crowd crafting. And this is basically what it looked like. You're seeing sort of a, a mock-up of the, of the interface. These digital humanitarians, these digital humanitarian volunteers from the Digital Humanitarian Network would go to our dedicated and customized website, and they'd see a tweet that was coming posted during the first two days. They'd have this displayed. They'd be asked to click on the link to see whether that link actually um, put, was to a website that maybe included pictures, maybe to Instagram, TwitPic, or, or what have you, or YouTube, or what have you. And so they'd look at the pictures. In this case, I'm showing you an example of, okay, yes, this link actually uh, links to two pictures that clearly show disaster damage. So the volunteer then is able to tag and say, yes, there's disaster damage. And oh, by the way, it mentions the location and the content of the tweet. So what happens then is if you click that tag, and checkbox, you are basically displayed with a map, a Google map or an open street map, and the volunteer then basically identifies where on the map of the Philippines that particular uh, set of pictures uh, were taken. So what was the result of this? By uh, 0500, in fact, just half an hour before at 4.30 a.m. Geneva time, we were able to send the UN the result of our uh, microtasking efforts that were carried out by volunteers from all around the world using this microtasking platform. And we collected about 100 or so individual data points, meaning individual pictures slash videos that we were able to uh, tag as showing disaster damage and then also to geo, geo reference. And the result was this map um, that the UN created within half an hour of us sending uh, them our, our data. And this map is incredibly unique. and and, and, and and is a source of hope, I think, for many of us who work in digital humanitarian response, because this map is the only map of its kind that is an official UN crisis map that is entirely sourced from social media content, from user-generated content, multimedia content, shared on Twitter in real time, that is then collected by volunteers from around the world and, and, and processed using an open source, uh, free and open source microtasking platform. It really is incredibly unique. And this a uh, map was shared beyond just UN OCHA with other UN agencies as well as the Filipino government. And from what I understand from one senior UN official was used to actually inform decision making. Certain decisions were taken thanks to this particular map which would not otherwise have been taken without this uh, crowdsourced uh, crisis map. Now, one of the reasons I'm so excited as well about the potential of microtasking as demonstrated here is well, the best analogy is sort of throwing darts, right? Is is the fact that these microtasking platforms have built-in quality control mechanisms. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. So with what we did during the Philippines, what we did actually was we showed every tweet, every single tweet was showed to at least three different volunteers. So it took three volunteers to vote, if you'd like, on each tweet. And only if three separate individual volunteers tagged a particular tweet, like voted on that particular tweet as saying that that tweet links to an image that captures disaster damage, did we actually then take that particular image and then share it and georeference it and share it with the United Nations? So we use this idea of triangulation between digital humanitarian volunteers to ensure a high quality data output that we can then provide for our disaster response colleagues. Now. When we did this in December, honestly, to be completely honest, you know, we were making it up as we went along. We had barely 12 hours to figure out how the heck we were going to do this because we basically ended up 
t uh, microtasking over 20,000 tweets, over 20,000 links. And it took a long time to get the technology up, to customize the platform, to get the, the, the folks ready to, to tag the images and so on. So it was, it was not perfect. Uh, it, it may sound impressive, and in many ways it was, and our volunteers really rallied, and we were able to provide a, a, a data that, that helped the UN. But, but maybe it was still, uh, there's still a lot of room for improvement. So when the United Nations at OSHA came back to me a few months later, earlier this year, and said, okay, this was amazing, this was great, this, this, this was, uh, you know, really in incredible for us to do this, such a rapid disaster damage assessment. Um, we want to do this again in future disasters. Are you ready? And I said, absolutely not. We're in no way ready to do this again. This was just... Uh, very quick and dirty, and and no, we're not ready. But but given the interest um, that that the UN and others have had in doing something like this again, I decided to, to make sure we would be ready. So we set up a project uh, in partnership with UNOCHA called Micro Mappers that we are actually uh, launching next month. But you can already go to micromappers.com that will streamline and. Uh, the process of microtasking for disaster response. We are developing and have already developed highly customized microtasking apps geared directly, specifically for disaster response. And you can learn more, as I mentioned, at micromappers.com. And they're also going to be completely free and open source. And it's a project that I'm very excited to collaborate with Maria and her team at Rappler to see how we can make best use of this in the context of the, the Philippines. I think it has a lot of promise, and you can learn more at micromappers.com. So another reason I'm really excited about the potential of microtasking is that once you've got these microtasking apps, there's a lot you can do with them. You may be familiar with um, the recapture um, spam filter, right? Now, the beauty of recapture is, yes, it, it certainly serves as a spam filter for your emails and for other login pages and so on. And as, as some of you may know, the, the, the spam filter recapture also processes information that is useful uh, as a result. So these, these words that you see displayed uh, often come from uh, text that's been scanned. Um, for example, from the New York Times, and this is how the New York Times was able to transcribe its entire archives going back decades, is by people typing in these words, they serve a purpose. So what we've done at QCRI is we've basically taking the recapture model, and we've created a disaster recapture model. So here you see the official lo email login page for our UN OCHA colleagues. And what we've done is we've added a recapture plugin below the login page that you see here displayed. And what this um, asks uh, UN colleagues to do when they enter their email in order to filter for any spam um, and hacking attempts is to identify which picture, which of the five pictures, there could be more than one, shows disaster damage. So it's the same idea as micromappers. We're pulling in information, images from Twitter during disasters, and we're displaying it in this plugin, and we're asking people who are logging into their emails to tag which pictures actually show disaster damage. Um, and if they get it wrong, then they have to do it again, just like a normal, re normal recapture. So it's another way of tapping what is called sort of cognitive surplus, people who have extra time on their hands, or they have to log in anyway, so they might as, as well click on a picture. And it can get even more fun and interesting than this, because as, as you know, uh, these massive multiplayer games, uh, online games, have hundreds of millions of users. In fact, we see statistics that uh, people spend bi a billion hours online in, in total around the world playing uh, these online games every week. I mean, this is a huge amount of, of time that is spent online playing playing games. And what we want to do is we want to tap that. We we want to work with these online gaming communities to have them be a uh, be be play a role in digital humanitarian response. We know, for example, that the online gaming community with the World of Warcraft uh, game is very active when it comes to disaster response. After the earthquake and tsunami in Japan, and after the the major uh, hurricane uh, in New York, Hurricane Sandy, they they mobilized. They they created a campaign to raise millions of dollars for those who were affected by these tragic tragic disasters. So they are socially conscious, and they want to be more socially conscious. So my colleagues and I have launched something called the Internet 
Response League. And we just want to show you an example of how it would work. We're collaborating right now with one major online gaming company to see if we can partner with them for this. But let's take, let's take for example, World of Warcraft. Uh, let's say you have logged in and you're asked, oh, do you want to join the Internet Response League in case we need your help during a disaster? And you say yes. So when you're playing a game and a disaster happens, let's say uh, an earthquake in uh, Los Angeles, well, you get a message that basically says, hey, an earthquake has happened. Uh, do you want to volunteer for the Internet Response League to support, for example, the American Red Cross? Now, let's say you say yes. In which case you see uh, this pop-up plugin from the Internet Response League (IRL) that asks you to rate the severity of damage that you see in a picture. These pictures again are taken from social media in in real time and then filtered and, and automatically filtered and uploaded to to the IRL plugin. And then you can rate and say, okay, yeah, this picture has lots of damage and it shows fire or it shows electricity lines. Uh, that have been uh, damaged and so on. So we're exploring this further, and again, it shows you the potential of using human computing, or what's also called crowd computing. If we can de develop these free and open source plugins for email use, for micromappers, for online gamers, we can really bring this whole village, this online digital village together to look at all these pictures. And if we're talking about millions of online gamers, they can tag millions of pictures in a, in a matter of minutes. Imagine we could have done what we did in the Philippines in 60 seconds if we had micromappers, if we had the recapture plugin, and if we had the Internet Response League. Now, crowd computing on its own is not necessarily the full solution, which is what brings me now to this idea of um, machine computing, right? Uh, crowd computing provides you with filters, but but people do get tired eventually, and you want machines to come in. So a data set that looks uh, really big, because the big data is relative, um, actually for a computer will not look as overwhelming, will look quite small. So this is where I turn now back to the, the, the slide on human computing and uh, machine computing. And I mentioned machine computing includes machine learning and... and um, natural language processing, and, and so on. So, And I promised that I would give you a real-world examples and not just talk about science fiction crazy terms. So I want to give you an example from um, the major tornadoes that swept through Oklahoma a few months ago in the U.S. And this was the largest uh, Category 5 tornado ever recorded in the history of the United States, Category 5, miles wide, and completely devastated, as you can see the picture here, the city of, of more large neighborhoods around that. Now, you may know about the uh, American Red Cross. They have a, a digital operations center, which is really the only one of its kind around the world as far, as far as the international community of the Red Cross goes. They're incredibly innovative, incredibly forward-thinking, incredibly experimental and open to experimenting with new technologies. And this digital operations center uses uh, different platforms and uses digital volunteers to, to monitor um, social media and to respond during during disasters. The catch is, they're doing this pretty much manually. So on a on a good day, i.e., when there are no disasters, they're monitoring and manually reading about 5,000 tweets uh, a day. Now that's on a good day. When a disaster happens, that that skyrockets to millions of tweets, and that's exactly what happened during the uh, the tornado in Oklahoma. There were over three million tweets posted during the first sort of 36. Uh, hours with the various uh, tornado hashtags, and there was no way in heck that they could they could manage this big big crisis data. So they got in touch with my team and I at QCRI and said, "Hey, you know, you guys are developing some some automated machine computing solutions for this. Can you help us automatically identify people who are posting needs on Twitter uh, in the aftermath of this of this tornado?" And also people who are offering help, because we're seeing both, right? People needing help and obviously people who are less affected and who want to offer help. So we said, sure, we'd be, of course, be happy to help. And, and what we did was use machine learning. Now, machine learning may sound like a new term, but it's been around for more than half a century. It started becoming more popular sort of in the 1950s uh, and 60s when computer scientists were interested in trying to teach computers how to play chess and how to win at chess. And we know now that these computers are very, very sophisticated. Um, and the idea of machine learning is basically to teach computers the ability to learn um, 
on the, on their own, right? Uh, so what we've been doing simply is using this field that's been around for half a century and applying it to teaching algorithms, teaching the computer how to find t tweets that are of interest to humanitarian organizations. So just as an illustration here, say you're following Twitter with different hashtags, all you have to do with the platform we're developing, which is also free and open source, is, is to tag those tweets, to check those tweets that refer to, in this case, needs, right? You're looking at the tweets coming in and say, okay, yeah, this tweet is a need, this tweet is a need. And what you're doing by doing that is teaching the algorithm what it is you're looking for. You're, 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 you're creating these machine learning classifiers, which is the technical, the technical term. So in a way, it's just like, uh, I like to think, as you can see in the next picture, just like teaching uh, a dog how to fetch a ball or fetch a, a bone and, and coming back with the ball, hopefully. And what we've been able to do the past few months is to teach uh, our classifiers to find all kinds of different uh, information on Twitter, such as infrastructure damage, such as information on casualties and injuries, um, such as, I mean, basically anything you, you really want. Uh, people, you know, looking for help online and offering help, as well as we can also tell, um, uh, identify which tweets are written by eyewitnesses, which is obviously really important for disaster response. Now, the accuracy we're getting from all of these is between 80% right now and 98%. Uh, but the beauty of machine learning is the more tagging you do, like I showed in the previous slide, the more accurate your automatic classifier will actually be. So it only gets better over time the more, uh, the more tweets you tag. So this is a project called ADR, A-I-D-R, which stands for Artificial Intelligence for Disaster Response, which is also a free and open source platform that, like Micromappers, we're looking to launch in the next uh, couple months, so th this, this fall. And the project, uh, like Micromappers, is a partnership with uh, UN OCHA, UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. But these platforms will be free and open source and will be usable by anyone, uh, certainly not only humanitarian established formal traditional humanitarian organizations, but other civil society groups, other local communities, and so on. And it's an exciting uh, experimental platform that we are looking to um, to pilot with 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 all of you, with with uh, Maria and her team at Rappler and other uh, partners and colleagues in the Philippines and around the world. These are experimental platforms right now, but I'm an optimistic, I'm an eternally optimistic kind of guy. So I think this will help us. It'll definitely be better than what we have now, which is which is nothing in many respects. Um, very much. You can get in touch with me at any time. I uh, answer all emails, so feel free to email. Everything I've shared with you right now, I've blogged about on irevolution.net, and you can also ping me on, on Twitter at Patrick Meyer. Thanks so much for your time, and uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Hold on, Patrick. Oh, hey, Josh. Oh, hey, Patrick. Oh, there he is. All right, there he is. Okay, we can take two questions. Another awesome hat. Oh, look at that guy. Siguro kal kalbo din siya, no? Mabuhay mga kalbo. Okay, we have a question uh, in the back. And we have a question from him also. Okay, two questions. Oh, sorry, questions. go ahead, you first. Okay. Hi, my name is Pamela. I'm a design anthropologist from Curiosity. So, I have uh, two questions, quick ones. So, I've been interviewing rescuers um, uh, as part of my research on, on flooding. And... Um, I can see two relevant um, experiences that they consistently tell. One is um, aggregated visualized data is helpful, and especially pictorial data. But one of their problems is once they receive it in aggregated form, um, it usually takes about sometimes as long as seven hours from them to leave their base to the area that they're about to rescue. And by the time that they arrive, the, the, the visual data that they receive um, is no longer relevant. Sometimes the situation is actually worse or better, and whatever action plan they've prepared for isn't relevant anymore. Um, the second is, one of their biggest problems is prioritizing who to rescue. 
Um, and that's currently, in, in the form that they're receiving information at the moment, it doesn't include people who are senior citizens, who are pregnant, families who have infants, families with PWDs. So is there a way to include this data so that it's easier for them to prioritize who to go to during an event of disaster? That's a really great question, Palma. Really, really important. I'm really glad you, you raised it. Um, so on the on, on information, information becoming obsolete very quickly, you're absolutely right. It speaks to the point of, you know, information being the most perishable commodity in disasters. At the same time, information is a commodity that travels the fastest um, uh, during disasters. So, so, the, so there's still hope here. And the idea, what we're trying to move to is trying to get from real-time information to real-time response, right? But as you're, quite, you're, you're very correctly noting, real-time information does not make a humanitarian organization a real-time organization, which is why we need a more distributed, I think, networked approach and a bottom-up approach. Um, how to solve this, which leads to your, your, your second question, um, is uh, how do we connect to, to not just those who are on social media, but other, other demographics and so on is a, is a really major challenge. And I think it, it speaks to the fact that while I'm talking about social media right here, right now, um, Radio is still very much the most important widespread technology for disaster response. It's what all of us fall back on when everything else goes down, right? So the idea that it's not, it's not an either or, but it's to look at um, this information ecosystem as an ecosystem and to look at how we can develop different technologies within this ecosystem to connect the different nodes. Can you connect um, social media with SMS, with radio programming, um, there are a number of projects like this um, that I've uh, followed in, in, in uh, for example, in the Central African Republic and Somalia that work incredibly well when you start com combining these new technologies with traditional technologies. And let's not forget television uh, as well. So it, it's really about making full use of this ecosystem, this ecology of information technology tools, and making them as interoperable as possible, right? And, and, and word of mouth as well is really important. One of the things that happened after Hurricane Sandy uh, in the worst hit areas uh, in Long Island was people didn't create a, a phone chain, but the, what they called a, a face chain. So people, I would basically be responsible for uh, notifying five people, and then these five other people would be responsible for notifying five, five people each as well. So you have this true people, but this is all done face to face. So they would go around in the neighborhood to the areas where elderly individuals were were living, families, and so on. People who were disconnected. It was all done face to face uh, at the hyper local level. So that's really important as well. And, and analog tools and offline tools, using flyer, using a, bu a bulletin board, a chalkboard in the middle of a, of a village can be really, really important as well. All of this is, is, doesn't become less important with new technologies. It, it, it is equally important with, with new technologies. Uh, but I have a feeling that you, know, you are the expert on this, right? Working at the field level with the communities. And I'd love to, at some point now or later, uh, learn about how you manage some of these challenges because there's a lot that we need to learn from your experience in the Philippines and share with my colleagues, for example, in, in Central African Republic and Somalia. Thank you. So essentially, there's no silver bullet, basically. It's an ecosystem. I agree. Next, Next question. question. Hello. Hi, Hi Patrick. Um, I was really interested in what you were talking about with uh, microtasking and real-time response. And I guess my question is, uh, how have you been able to use your experiences and the information you've gathered to really build on this and help humanitarian agencies um, in risk profiling so that they'll be able to uh, give, a, uh, give better responses or even prepare for disasters before they happen? That's an excellent question. All right, these are super, that, that's really great. And it's a conversation I want to have as well, because right now, as you're correctly noting, you know, the Micromappers Initiative and using human computing has come out of sudden onset disasters, right? Like the Philippines. We'd never done this before the Philippines uh, typhoon. So it's, it was really, it's been very much focused on this. Now, I would love to collaborate with anyone who's interested to see how we can use Micromappers for doing this risk assessment, right? and risk profiling, is, as you mentioned, ahead of time so we can identify areas that are perhaps 
uh, more resilient than others and, and, and see how we can build additional resilience in these areas that are perhaps not as, as resilient. How can we use that information as a feedback loop with local communities, right? So how do you transform this idea of big data, which is a bit sort of uh, abstract, and use big data to build community resilience? It's actually an area that I'm super interested uh, and becoming increasingly interested and want to try and explore. I'm not an expert in, in, in um, disaster risk reduction, uh, disaster prevention, uh, preparedness, but I, it's an area that I, I want to learn about and, and, and want to uh, connect with in order to see if we can use some of these technologies. I think ultimately, you know, this, this micro-tasking platform or the AIDR platform, they're information management platforms, right? Um, so, so information management is equally important before the disaster as it is during and after in the reconstruction phase. So I, I would love to, I don't know, all, I don't have all the answers, and, but I'd love to have a conversation with you. So if you'd like to get in touch, we can get on Skype uh, today, tomorrow, whenever, whenever you'd like and, and figure that out together. Thanks for that. I'll probably get in touch with you soon enough, I guess. Thanks. Super, please do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick, as well. Thanks, all. Thanks, Patricia. Thanks, uh, Casey. Appreciate it. Have a great rest of the conference. I'll be following online. All right. Thank you very much. All right. I have a question for you guys now. Go on. Are you hungry? Yes. That's great. But before we eat, I would like to read a monologue. It's going to take just about an hour. It's fine. <laughs> no, it is time for it's time lunch. For lunch. Um, but please stay seated. Okay, you will be served right here, and if you guys want to actually eat at a table, you can proceed to the SGV case room, the Korean case room, the Indonesian case room. Uh, don't ask me where they're at, because I have no clue. And it, it, there is a strictly clean-as-you-go policy. Matter of fact, there is a, a garbage Nazi out there. If you leave garbage, you will be electrocuted. So please, clean up your mess. All right, stay in your seats. We have one last video for you guys to watch. It's very short. 